one of the very first direct taxes on the American colonies by the British Crown was the Stamp Act. It was passed through Parliament on March the 22nd of 1765 to take effect November 1st of that year. This act placed a fee on just about every paper transaction in everyday use. This would include contracts, newspapers, playing cards, bills of sale, and the list goes on. Of course, it would mean paying a penny tax on the paper needed to write that list. This tax levied by the British government was for the purpose of raising funds to defray the cost of the recent French War, as well as to provide for the protection of colonists from the tribes living beyond what was then known as the Western Frontier. In the Proclamation of 1763, King George had reserved all of the territory west of the Appalachian Mountains for the Native Americans. After all, a costly war for their benefit, it's only right that they do their part to pay the bill. The streets of the town of Boston in the colony of Massachusetts became the scene of some of the earliest reaction to the Stamp Act, and it was not positive. For many years, there had existed a large gap between the plain Bostonian, who may now be called a blue-collar man, perhaps employed at the dockyard or as a street vendor or carpenter, in the upper-class citizenry. These hard-working folk had tired of hearing themselves referred to as rabble, or worse, by those whose lives seemed to continue unfettered regardless of the economic climate. Many of the Stamp Act opponents were well aware that their betters were dependent upon them to perpetuate the lives to which they had become accustomed. On August 14, 1765, the likeness of Andrew Oliver, the appointed stamp agent for Massachusetts, was hung in effigy in Boston's South End. The tree selected for this hanging was a large elm which later took on the moniker of the Liberty Tree. A local sheriff was ordered to remove the effigy by Lieutenant Governor Hutchinson. Although he had four stout deputies alongside him, he was unsuccessful due to the opposition from large crowds of Bostonians on hand for the festivities. After the fall of darkness, 28-year-old French War veteran and well-known Boston cobbler, Sergeant Ebenezer McIntosh, led a large group of like-minded folks, all sharing a similar attitude toward an attempt to institute this tax upon them, something they would not tolerate. The mock effigy of Oliver, under heavy volunteer guard at the now legendary elm, was cut down and brought to the townhouse, where legislative meetings were held. The next stop for the mob was Oliver's office, which was summarily and quite thoroughly destroyed and the timbers symbolically stamped. The stamp agent's carriage house in livery was then burned, along with his effigy. His main residence was looted, and any symbol of affluence such as fine dishes and glassware and furniture smashed. In a truly admirable move on his part, Sergeant McIntosh personally supervised the relocation of the wine cellar contents in order to avoid possible public injury by explosion before setting the house ablaze. Reportedly, this included several bottles of the particularly dangerous varietals known as Port and Madeira. The following day, Andrew Oliver requested and received permission to resign his public office. This gesture, however, proved not enough for the shoemaker-turned-activist. Not nearly enough. McIntosh and his followers forced Oliver to be paraded up and down the streets and publicly declare his resignation beneath the Liberty Tree. Governor Bernard now demanded that the local sworn militia be called out to quell this growing disturbance. His plan fell through when the official was informed by his staff that much of the mob in question were indeed members of the militia. Eventually, Ebenezer McIntosh was arrested along with six other protest participants. Although suspected as the mob's ringleader, McIntosh and the rest were soon released for lack of hard evidence, together with the threat of further violence. A 300-pound bounty was offered for the identification of the riot leader, as much as that sum was an immense fortune to Macintosh's cronies, it was never claimed. The Stamp Act was repealed in March of 1766. The Sons of Liberty came about as a result of this act, having formerly been known as the Loyal Nine. 
Touch not the cat, but a glove. Hello everyone. If you're enjoying the Touch Not channel, please hit that subscribe button, the little wildcat button at the lower right at the end of each video. I would appreciate it very much. It helps us out. And share a link to this channel with your friends. Thank you.